Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 831. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today is November 17th, 2023. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted, probably going to be one of the most popular show we ever put out. I'm going to put that out there right now. This is our happy spot. This is where George and I have our happy place, and we do that because we sit down with our webcams and we talk about the stuff we find interesting in the news, and somehow you guys like that too. This is a sister site of Anglican.inc. George and I and many others post stories on Anglican.inc that involve news around the communion. We recommend that you go there. I'll have a link in the show notes if you can't type Anglican dot i n k in your browser george how are you doing this week i am doing fantastic it's been a miserable week in the <laughs> church news sure oh, but yeah. god is still sovereign mm -hmm. it is his will that things are unfolding in this way now why i don't know perhaps it's the time for old things to pass away and new things to be born but even while we've got uh, the Church of England imploding, we had two baby boys born in the parish. Uh, so my church grew by two people this week. And, you know, the joy of just welcoming little Henry and little Dean into this church. I get to do this Sunday, the service of Churching of Women from the 1928 prayer book. Welcome the mommies back into the church after the successful birth of their babies. Mm -hmm. We do need to realize that sometimes we can get ourselves so overpowered and overwhelmed by the by the war in the Middle East, by the economy, by politics, by church life, that we forget that God is still sovereign and his reign can never be changed. And we just need to be faithful to him in all things, no matter the circumstances around us. Yeah. Uh, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, uh, and that is unchanging. Uh, his ability to transform us from sinners to, to the righteous is uh, undeniable and unchanging, despite the anxiety you may be feeling right now because of your church leadership, because of war, rumors of war, politics, and everything else going on around the world. Uh, we are... Uh, past the 2000 year mark where we have uh, just tangible proof of God's everlasting love for us. Despite how broken we are as a church, as people in the church, and as a secular society. Uh, and I, I just want to recommend to people that uh, don't ever panic. Uh, and here's what I always used to tell my children, Dad, this is really scary. This is really scary. You can panic when Dad panics. Okay, when you see me panic, you have every right to panic. I'm not panicked yet. I'm disappointed. We've seen this before. We don't know how this will play out. But the most cool thing is, it's not our first news story, George. We're going to start somewhere else. Let me uh, ring up the show notes. The show notes say we're going to start all the way over with the ACNA. They have a new bishop elect of Cascadia. His name is Jack Worley, George. Jake Worley, Jacob what, Worley. What did I say, Jack? Jake, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. He's been in the news before. Mm -hmm. uh, he's an American, uh, was a priest in the Diocese of the Rio Grande Episcopal Church, left to join the AMIA, then the ACNA, served some time overseas, and then was up in Canada, northern Canada on the West Coast. And he was elected bishop of... Uh, Oh, it's just gone out of my head. But the yeah, diocese just, along yeah. the border with Alaska, not mm -hmm. the Yukon, but the one just south of that. Um, if you watch the uh, Ice Road Truckers or uh, the, those, those sorts of shows, that sort of place. Well, the Anglican Church of Canada's bishops refused to ratify his election because of his uh, connection with the ACNA. And... He had already left his parish post and he found that he had to leave Canada, he and his family, because he no longer had a job. Therefore, his work visa was worthless. And he had, so after being elected bishop, he finds himself unemployed. Well, he made it back to the United States. Uh, he was, I think, rector of the church in Fort Worth. Uh, 
the uh, the one evangelical Fort Worth parish amongst all the Anglo Catholics, and has now been elected Bishop of Cascadia, which is uh, the Pacific Northwest, Seattle area, Oregon, and you know, God had his you know, God had a plan for him to be a bishop. It just he started down the wrong path, and it wasn't in the Anglican Church of Canada. It was to be in the ACNA. So congratulations to Jake Worley, and may he have a prosperous and wonderful ministry up in the frozen north. I like how we're contrasting our last story with really good news. Uh, Anik also has a bishop suffering, George. Yes, uh, I need a, Mike Stewart. Mike Stewart has just been elected at their synod, uh, which I think was in Vancouver this mm -hmm. past weekend. And Mike is an Englishman, originally from England, uh, trained, and he's an English evangelical who came over to serve in Canada and then moved into Anik, Anik and has now been elected their suffragan bishop. So it looks like uh, things are going to be pretty good in that part of the world. Except for the weather, it's going to be pretty good. <laughs> oh, now Vancouver's got nice weather. It, it, it can be rainy a lot, but when the sun shines, the sun shines. You take a little day trip, go up to Whistler uh, and, and visit the mountains. Uh, Vancouver is a wonderful city. Got to spend a day there with my wife, and uh, or a couple, oh, actually a whole week there. Beautiful place. All right, I George. Understand it, I understand it's one of the most expensive cities uh, to visit. It, it is because the longest time people from uh, China and uh, Asian countries were able to buy a property in the Vancouver and the uh, west side of Canada there, and it has uh, had a great effect on your ability to buy a two-bedroom house for less than two million dollars U.S. Ouch. Mm. All right, so let's move on to the story of the day, yes, week, probably, uh, year, of course, century, maybe. But let's find out what we got here, George. So we heard reports uh, early on that the recommendation that the bishops pass the or do something about LLF passed the, uh, the synod this week. You and I were surprised because we thought for sure we knew they had the bishop votes, but the we thought that the clergy and laity would hold the line. And uh, in that uh, uh, ending vote, the laity passed it by one, the clergy passed it by a couple, and the bishops, the leadership of the church, passed it overwhelmingly. And we need to talk here. We need to step back because we're kind of in this quagmire now. Do we run for the lifeboats? Do we jump out of a, a burning plane and, and grab our parachutes? Or do we wait and see what happens? And in that, I do want to recommend the people understand if you're going for the lifeboats, it's women and children first. If it's a parachute, you can grab whichever one is available to you. But George, let's, let's step back and find out what happened and what this means, first of all. Well, Synod was a three-day affair meeting at Church House in London this week. And the first day of the Synod saw uh, mostly answers to written questions. Uh, and then the LLF began the debate on the second day and extended into a third day. It was on Tuesday and Wednesday. And the LLF, Living in Love and Faith, was started about seven years ago, not as a process to study gay blessings, but as a conversation within the church. And somewhere it got hijacked into a vehicle to change the doctrine and discipline of marriage in the Church of England. So in February, the, the bishops gave their approval uh, in principle for same-sex blessings. And it came forward after continued debate over the summer in various meetings, how would this happen? What are the pastoral provisions? Is it legal? Pastoral provisions means, what if you don't want to do it? Will you be, will it, let's say, Church of England uh, is a parochial system in the country. It's, it's American churches are chaplaincies right. in an English yeah. sense, and that you opt in to being a member. In the Church of England, you have a right to be married in your parish church and be buried from there. And what if you're a gay couple and your parish priest is uh, opposed to gay blessings? You go and he says, sorry, I won't do it. Well, under the current system, if it's permitted uh, 
then they can file a clergy disciplinary CDM measure against you, and you'll spend the next year or two in in limbo and torture and horror as they go through you legally. And we and we so see what are the that. Pastoral that uh, provision? Uh, that, uh, that's not something that could happen. That is something that has happened. Yeah, we've seen we've seen the start of that. Uh, there's a case of a college chaplain at Trent College, which was an Anglican at once upon a time evangelical institution, a private school, and he. Uh, had to go through all this uh, uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity training, and some of it contained statements that were contrary to the doctrine of the Church of England, and he pointed this out, and he was fired and labeled a terrorist for not supporting gay blessings and whatnot, and his bishop uh, uh, didn't back him, and the tribunals basically jerked him around, and he's basically unemployed, uh, lost his career because he was faithful to the teachings handed down and are still legally the teachings of the Church of England, but he wasn't protected in any sense for his pastoral disagreement with where the mob is. So all of these things were to be laid out. Well, the bishops didn't get done the pastoral provisions. The bishops got legal advice, but they refused to share it. And some amendments were put forward uh, stating that, well, we can't really vote on this till we see the legal advice, because what if this is illegal? And, well, what do you mean, what if it's illegal? Well, there are rumors that the advice the bishops received was that, yes, what you're planning to do is a change of doctrine. And this is how, if you're going to doctrine, it needs two-thirds votes of synod, and it needs several meetings, and what you're doing is a 50% plus one way, and that's not lawful. So the rumors were for around the legal advice that they couldn't do this. And a resolution was put forward saying, well, let's see the legal advice so that we can vote on it. And the bishops uh, said, no, we're not going to show it to you. It was almost like, remember when Nancy Pelosi said, we'll tell you what's in the government bill <laughs> after you vote for yeah, it. Yeah, you don't need to see it before you vote for it. You don't even read. Why would you read it before you vote for it? Now, and another and another amendment was: What are the pastoral provisions before we vote for it? Well, they're going to be ready in November. And then a third amendment was put forward by Stephen Croft, the Bishop of Oxford, saying, "Well, we should have this. Not wait two years till the next synod, but we should have experimental uh, liturgies for those who want to use them now." before we have legal advice, before we have pastoral uh, uh, accommodation, before we have theological discussion. How, we, should how, just, we should, well, this is what the Episcopal Church did. Yeah, we I just know, did it. <laughs> you just did it and hoped that everybody would catch up. How is this not satanic? How is this not demonic and apostate? I mean, I, I hate to say it, but you, you, we have, through tradition, reason, ex and um, scripture, a knowledge base of how we conduct ourselves and handle doctrine. This is not new. But we've been handling this as a church for 2,000 years. And all of a sudden, the only way we can get this passed is to say, we don't want to involve the lawyers. They have an opinion. It's not ours. We don't need to involve the doctrine because this won't affect the doctrine. Well, I, I'm sorry, but what 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 was the Lex Rende, Lex Credendi about, George? Come on, this is ridiculous. The law, of, the law of praying is the law of believing. Yeah, and that's some consider that to be the Anglican mantra, where we pr our doctrine is set out in our prayer book, and if we're praying a certain thing, that means we believe it. Yeah. And if we've now reached a situation where that doesn't matter. Um, one of the uh, things that I, I watched bits of the Synod debates, I didn't watch it nonstop. There was an excellent uh, uh, statement of the traditional uh, worldview of, by Will Pearson Gee, a uh, rector in Buckinghamshire, England. A rector of Buckingham, I think he is, is his title. Wonderful speech, and if you can catch that, do look at that. That really does state where things are from the... Uh, I would call it Christian traditional perspective. But then so much else was my experience. I'm a gay man. I'm a lesbian woman. 
And I need this because my experience is that it's right and good. Well, frankly, I don't care about your experience because experience is not how we do things. We do things based on tr tradition, scripture, and reason. We don't do things based on experience. That's what the Pentecostals do. That's what uh, so the, some charismatics do. That's what they do on Wall Street. <laughs> experience is not how we define and perfect our church life. Now, it can be something that is added into the mix and discussion, but what we saw at Synod this week was scripture doesn't matter. Tradition doesn't matter. Reason, Reason. doesn't matter. Science doesn't matter. Medicine doesn't matter. Philosophy, we don't need that as well. History doesn't, nothing matters except experience. And I'm sorry, but that's not how Anglicanism works. Now, other religious groups may work that way, but that's just not how we should do things. Now we can say, but the Episcopal Church did it that way. Yes, but two wrongs don't make a right. <laughs> Well, so the so we had this so that the two amendments that wanted to get the legal opinion and get the pastoral stuff were defeated in close votes, and then the Bishop of Oxford's uh, amendment, which basically gutted uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury and York's promises of how we would do this, that passed by only a single vote in the House of Lady. Passed by two thirds in the bishops, passed fifty one percent, forty nine percent among the clergy, and passed by fifty point two to forty nine point eight among the laity. So, but here, but they've already taken out by doing this the mutual flourishing. We're not even going to deal with that. With this, with this amendment was put forward, we don't have to deal with the mutual flourishing. We knew it was a lie before. We don't have to use that lie for. Uh, this that was a lie we used for women's ordination. Uh, we don't need to lie to you. We have the votes We own the bishops and Look what we just did with the clergy and laity and this is all based on the same question George Did God really say that? Oh Why do we have to repeat this over and over again George? But what's interesting is that if you actually look Have to look at the what was actually been adopted versus what was reported in the secular sure. press. Now, insiders in the Church of England say, wait, 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 hold on. We haven't changed doctrine. We haven't stepped off the cliff. We've allowed some people to step off, step off the cliff, but they're doing it anyway. Now they just are doing it lawfully because the admissions have come out. Yes, we've been blessing same-sex uh, civil partnerships in church and now with the knowledge and permission of our bishop and now we can go ahead and do it anyway uh, this was said by the bishop dean of bristol on a radio interview after the uh, synod mandy something and so you know if you read ian paul who's a member of the archbishop's council and in the evangelical he's saying hold off now the the it we've not reached the end it's just we're now incredibly muddled and confused because all that's been asked is for the bishops to consider allowing this to take place, but it's not been determined whether what they want to do is legal yet. So the legality has to be established before it can take place, supposedly. Well, But then we go to the f other side of the conservative movement, which says the house is on fire, grab your kids, get out now. Here's Kevin's analogy as to where, do you want to know where you are? Here's where you are. You are in a boat called the Titanic. You have been told that there's icebergs in the water. Your captain, Archbishop of Canterbury, says we have the best boat available. We're not worried about icebergs. Full speed ahead. You haven't hit the iceberg yet. It's out there somewhere. That's where you are right now. And you're in a very dangerous spot. Ian Paul is correct. We ha you haven't really taken the plunge. But th that plunge is just moments 
or a synod or a vote away. And I, I fear for the Mother Church. I fear that the Mother Church of Anglicanism will fall. And thankfully, the Global South is out there, the Gafghans are out there, that there's uh, true Orthodox Anglican voices already on the shores of Britain. Um, the fall will be bad, but you're taking real people with you. You're taking parishioners with you down this fall. I don't really care if you go to hell. I care if you take other people with you. Yeah. There are a bunch of options being talked up at this stage. Mm -hmm. I, I think we should just sort of pass through them. Okay. Uh, and these are not in any order. They're just as they, my neurons fire off and uh, remind me of them. Uh, part of the, one of the questions asked, written questions was, have we been sued yet? And in Parliament, the question was asked to the uh, Second Church of States Commissioner, uh, has the Church of England been sued yet? Because Anglican Inc. and other outfits have uh, reported that Nicky Gumbel and the Alpha people will be bringing, not Alpha, but Nicky Gumbel sure. and that circle will be bringing litigation to prevent the Archbishop of Canterbury from going forward. And both in Parliament and in Synod, the answer was no, we've not been served with anything. Well, Nicky Gumbel doesn't make idle threats. He doesn't. And so now I expect <clears throat> that we'll see some correspondence from lawyers to making their way to church house and to the Lambeth Palace, basically pointing out this cannot be done. And if you do do it, you know, the, the, we're in the demand letter time. And then if they, if they ignore the demands, then we go to litigation. So we've got the litigation, that's, that's a real threat. And there's money behind the threat to make it stick. Now, the Church of England does have the money to defend themselves, so if this were the United States, this would be a two- or three-year process uh, fighting itself out. So what happens if you're in a bad diocese? If you're, let's, Di Oxford, for example, has one bishop and three area bishops, so if you got, and they're all liberals, and they're all pro-gay, pro-this, pro-that. What do you do? Do you send your money into the diocese? No, send it to Ephesians fund so that the pa parish contributions don't go to support the national church structures that are imposing this. And the second thing the Church of England Evangelical Council is offering is pastoral Episcopal support, where we'll have honorary assistant bishops who are retired Church of England bishops or local bishops who are given a license to operate. So for example, in the Diocese of Oxford, you have a retired Kenyan bishop who is now a parish priest, and that Kenyan bishop has been doing confirmations for conservative evangelical parishes. That honorary assistant will be your Episcopal pastoral support. So those are two initial things. Global South Fellowship of Anglicans have basically said, we're going to fight this battle at the top, and Justin Welby, you need to realize uh, it's over. Justin Welby put out a statement saying, oh, I abstained after the, uh, on the LLF vote because I still need to have a relationship with the Anglican Communion. Well, Kevin, do you, do you think that that convinced anybody? Well, hold on. Does not Revelation 3.16 say, let your yeses be yes and your noes be no? That's the other three sixteen, Justin, oh. Justin, I, I, I too call for your, 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 uh, retirement step down you, you I, I would say you can't do any more damage you probably could so please step down well the global south they're going to depose justin welby as the uh first among equals within the anglican communion mm -hmm. now the anglican consultative council is pushing back saying oh well you just can't do that the anglican consultative council has to do that well no i'm sorry it doesn't have that authority. It's a consultative <laughs> council. council. Has no authority. Has no <laughs> authority. And it's, uh, here's the funny thing. The, the, in general synod, the bishops are saying, we don't need no stinking lawyers. We don't need to conform to the law. <laughs> and now with the, the foreigners, these, these dumb bishops from Africa, oh, well, you can't do that because it's against the law. 
you got to it's you got to choose your argument. You can't be legalistic here and uh, carefree there. It's you know either or. And the Church of England has decided that law doesn't matter. So why should the primates be bound to something they never were agreed to? Yeah. So we're seeing the the top level moving in. However, there really isn't a move for an American style uh, fo foreign bishops parachuting in. Um, because there's already set up the Anglican uh, convocation in Europe, which is the Anglican mission in England, the Anglican network in uh, Europe, Anglican convocation in Europe. And the overseas bishops connected with GAFCON and the Global South have already made their, uh, they're not going to redo what was done in the United States because we're already at the ACNA stage. We are. There I is mean, already a lifeboat. There's alternatives and lifeboats there. Andy Lyons, um, you know, Free Church of England. There's places you can go. The problem is, can you take your church with you? Can you take your resources with you? How does it work? Here in America, we had the church wars. We had to do this in the courts. It was very difficult to take property from the Episcopal Church uh, because and in the Episcopal Church, you know the operatic saying where it's uh, not over until the fat lady sings. Our fat lady was a very thin Catherine Jefford Shorey. Do they have the equivalent over there of a fat lady? Because they don't have the equivalent of a Bob Duncan. Well, they could have the equivalent of a Bob Duncan. In other words, we could see somebody arise, but we certainly don't see them in the Episcopal ranks. Right. There is somebody who has uh, been exemplary through all this, and that's the Bishop of Lancaster, Jill Duff. Oh. She uh, went on uh, Transworld Radio UK to basically lambast what just happened. And the difficulty is that there is a significant portion of the conservative wing that does not accept the ordination of women bishops. So she's not really the ideal person to take it forward though she is uh, saying and doing all the things that I wish other bishops would do. So but Jill can't. Duff is the one wearing the pants at this stage. She is, but here's the problem, George. Long ago, the Church of England stopped electing Christians to be bishops. People who've le lived transformed lives, people who fit in the Titus 1-9, people who uh, are there to grow the church, They've elected politicians who don't mind wearing a collar into the Episcopacy. And here's what you get. Boom, boom. You got a broken church. Broken. So we, we and then we published uh, an item uh, from, uh, uh, who is it? I oh, I'm just. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> we just published an op-ed piece this morning on Anglican Inc., by uh, Nigel, you got the Nigel, Nigel? At Nigel yeah. Atkinson. Yeah. Nigel Atkinson is a well-known evangelical. He's up in the northwest of England, and essentially, what he's saying is that stay in your church, don't walk away, but fight to the end. And almost in an American imagery, imagine that you're a homesteader on the prairie or something. Um, you fight, you know, until the Indians burn down your cabin, uh, you, you're not going to go anywhere. Let them take you out on a stretcher. Stand and speak the truth. Speak your opposition. Don't give them any money. But don't hand them a victory by walking away. Stay and fight and contend for the gospel where you are. And that is akin to the church society's arguments as well. So and then you have people saying, we got to get out, we got to get out now. So we've got legal strategies, we've got pastoral strategies, we've got stay and fight, we've got um, fight but pull out. But we don't have an overall leader and we don't have an overall plan. Now, were I to make a suggestion, I'm not going to give you guys in England who are thinking what to do and answer because I don't know it. But I do think what is needed right now, most of all, is a pastoral, spiritual solution. So that once you are at tune and at peace with God in your heart and not acting out of panic or fear, 
you can make the right decision for you and your congregation mm -hmm. and allow God's love to arise from your actions. See, one of the things we saw in the Episcopal Church is fights was just the nastiness and negativity and destructiveness, money thrown away, tens of millions of dollars in legal fees. I, hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions. Yeah. I, Alan uh, A.S. Haley mm -hmm. uh, chronicled this. And it so poisoned so many people. And it drove some people out of organized religion entirely. Sure. Because they looked at these Christians and thought, I don't want to be like either side. So the, the the traditionalists have the dual burden of being an elusive, being the loser in a political game, but must they must express the confidence and joy of being winners in the ecclesial in the eschatological, godly game. Now, so we let, can't use the tools of the enemy. However, use it, and I, I don't think we're here yet. I don't think you're here yet. But le, compare and contrast with the Episcopal Church of the Church of Canada. Okay, uh, right now, uh, all the promises that were given to the conservatives with women's ordination and with the uh, uh, gay marriage were lies. Of course you can keep your faith and, and, and serve in the Episcopal Church. Of course we won't make you do anything. Well, well what do you think we are, monsters? And uh, guess what, George? They were monsters. <laughs> they were satanic. And so if you, if you, at a certain point, you allow something to happen, I don't see examples of where churches can go back. The Church of Canada can't go back. That's gone. The Episcopal Church can't go back. Uh, there's a movement right now to save the Episcopal Church. I, I think you're too late. I, I think there's just no way to go back uh, to that position uh, in the 1970s where it was still savable. I th don't think the Church of England has gone to that point yet where it can't be saved, but oh, it's so close to that iceberg, George. Well, I think if we look at history, there might be uh, arguments that in your favor. We certainly saw, you know, the Episcopal Church has arrived at the point where Bill Love uh, was kicked out of the Episcopacy Mm -hmm. were forced to resign because he wouldn't go along with uh, false doctrine. We've seen in the Church of Sweden uh, and in the Church of Norway, on October 24th, uh, Kerry Weiderberg, who's the Bishop of Oslo, led a talk at their seminary in Oslo to young, the young theological students and said, look, if you're not in favor of gay blessings, don't you should withdraw it. from the ordination process because we will soon require all priests must do gay blessings. And the majority of Swedish bishops already hold this position. Now, the Church of Sweden and the Church of Norway have followed the progression of this is a minority thing that we're going to have a past provision for a small amount of people. It doesn't affect you if you don't want to. To you must do this. The Church of England's uh, LLF process is that uh, you don't have to do this, but you must refer somebody to people who will. So you must be complicit in sin is the counter argument. Well, that was where the Church of Norway was a year or two ago. And now it's advanced that unless you do this, you cannot be a priest in the Church of Norway. You must leave. And that's where we are in certain parts of the United States in the Episcopal Church. But at the same time, um, I do believe that there is hope for the Episcopal Church. I do believe there's hope, but I, um, because I don't think uh, God has fully withdrawn his Holy Spirit from all parts of the church. There is a remnant out there that hopes to bring things alive again. What form it takes, I don't know. Yeah, but, I mean, but God is still yeah. glorified in some churches in the Episcopal world. You see it. I don't see it, but you and I both know neither entity has gone so far that it can't be redeemed, that mm -hmm. it can't change course. And of course, that is my desire that the Episcopal Church uh, returns to uh, God, repents of its sins. I, I pray that for the Anglican Church. 
Uh, I, and I, now I'm going to have to play that for the, the Church of England. Uh, that, you know, it, it wakes up and says, oh, wait a minute. We're doing it wrong. So, yeah. And this is the value of leaders. This is the value of leaders. There was one church, Kevin, that changed its mind. Mm -hmm. We were talking about it before the show. Yeah. And that was so the Lithuanians or the Latvi Latvians? Latvians, yeah. The Church of Latvia, Evangelical Lutheran Church of Latvia. It's an Episcopal church. Mm -hmm. um, they had been pro-women's orders, and then they had a new archbishop, and then they thought about this, and then they said, no, that was a mistake. It wasn't, uh, We do, it, in our view, it was not godly. It was not uh, scripturally a sound, and we are not going to fire all the women clergy, but we're just not going to ordain any new right. ones. It, we, we went off course, we returned to course, in, in their words. Now, but, and, their, but the thing was, that was an archbishop yeah. who, who basically so. led, he didn't mm -hmm. just get elected and say, okay, from today on, but rather he spent time mm -hmm. cultivating and preparing the church for this transformation back to what it had been. Now, if you look at that in Latvia, the church is far different than the culture of Latvia, yet mm -hmm. it grows. People, people find honor in a church that sticks with its morals. People find honor in a church, even if they disagree with it, at least the church stands for something. There's nothing weaker on the planet Earth than a church that doesn't stand for its own morals. Yeah. But, you know, as I listen to myself talk, I'm reminded of an episode of Seinfeld. Oh, no. Where <laughs> George Costanza wants to convert to Latvian Orthodox, I think it was, in order to, for a girl or something. And the joke was Latvian Orthodox. I mean, how much far, you know, strange, outlandish, totally outside of the mainstream can you be? And we're offering up the Latvian Lutherans <laughs> as an example so maybe we're maybe this truly is also an anglican show about nothing like uh, seinfeld was a show about nothing yeah. oh, I don't oh, know. i'll bring up a different show uh was it not phoebe who talked ross out of his true belief in evolution in an episode of friends i mean and then the, her response was wait you changed your mind i've lost all respect for you <laughs> so, I mean, uh, and, and that's just it. The, the society does not respect a church that changes itself uh, uh, without transforming itself. And it, it's so sad. All right, what, what we got here? We're 40 minutes in. Have we talked this to death? And we are at the point where we're still in the fog of what happened. You know, uh, the Ian Poles are right. The evangelicals are right. The conservatives are right. Um, there's a shock to the system. But the liberals are shocked too, George. They're like, wait a minute, okay, we won, but we didn't win. This is a victory, hail Satan, but we didn't really win. Well, Kevin Holdsworthy, he's the dean of Glasgow, he's mm -hmm. a uh, longtime prominent activist for the liberal cause, is, is poo-pooing a lot of this by saying that look we want gay marriage we want full equality and we're and they've not changed doctrine they've not given us marriage they're allowing us to do stuff that our liberal bishops are all letting already allowing us to do it's just now that we won't get beaten up for doing what we've been allowed to do and nobody's been beaten up for doing so there are some and you know the colin coward friend of this show uh, has I, I hope that he said, doesn't look, mind that. Okay, he's a friend of Kevin and George. I don't want him to get pissed by every time we say friend of the show, but uh, we rely on him for accurate reporting of what's happening behind the scenes, George. At his point is that uh, he is so thoroughly sick of all this because no minds have been changed on either side. There's no movement. And he says, you know, he's been doing this for 30 years, and the arguments he's been hearing for 30 years, the arguments he heard this past week. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that the needle moved like a half a percentage point this way or that way, and who knows if the next synod will see more conservatives elected, it'll move it the other direction. So there's not 
joy in Mudville tonight, folks. Uh, nobody seems to be happy with this. Um, so we'll just see how, how it unfolds. Yeah, I mean, there were parts in, and you and I have been reporting on the Episcopal Church for a long time, where we would come back from some meeting and we were shocked by what had happened. And we get back and after a couple of weeks, oh, what we thought happened really didn't happen. You know, this, and this is a prime example. But let, let's just talk things through here. Uh, I have called, I'm a nobody, okay, I'm a layperson here in the ACNA for the Archbishop of Canterbury to resign. Uh, Lee uh, Gratis, Gratis did the same thing. Um, As did Jane Ozan from the uh, yeah. left. It, it, I mean, he's not going to listen to me. Who will he listen to? Yeah, obviously, the king. Uh, to, to step down. This is well. Okay, Mrs. This is well, well. <laughs> but but should he step down? I mean, uh, obviously he's not a person looking to fix the situation, uh, rather than uh, to kind of make the oh, what's the the via media? Is there an in between place in uh, gay blessings and the Anglican Church where I could just force this through and still? get away with, with without being uh, uh, hung by the stake, George. I do not want Justin Welby to resign. Not that I agree with his uh, policies, mm -hmm. far from it. But the alternatives, I think, would be worse. Justin Welby still considers himself part of a part particular circles. He's an Etonian. He is a, a, a holy HTB alumni. Things matter to him that don't matter to other people. He's also badly damaged and weakened. And the conservatives will be in a better position to negotiate something with a damaged uh, Justin Welby than, let's say, if Stephen Cottrell or Sarah Merlali are uh, popped up. Then they, they have no uh, uh, compunction of shoving it down the evangelicals' throats. They have no uh, need. Uh, they're not wounded or damaged. Cottrell, uh, Cottrell, as he's called in England, I'm not particularly impressed with his intellect, but he is a political operative and he's a bit of a thug. Uh, the stereotypical Essex boy. Uh, I hate to say that because that's what I think you, people do. Yeah, I, but I think you've identified what his problem is. And, and so that he's not going to... Uh, give away as much as Justin Welby would. Mm -hmm. Now, Welby has to retire within two years because of his timing out of office and reaching retirement. And I think in the next two years, um, work because remember the English government's involved in this as well. We're going to see the fall of the government. I, as things stand right now, I don't think the conservatives would win a general election. And That's the prime minister is certainly going to push it off until the very last minute. And he can push it off for over two years. And at a certain point, he's going to need to shore up his conservative base, which he has treated very badly, badly. And one thing that he doesn't particularly care about is the Church of England. And there's room there to sort of satisfy some conservative voters by uh, moves in that area. Whereas a labor, if labor comes into power, um, you know, forget it. It's over. <laughs> I, yeah. That's my fear. I mean, for, for Britain to, to, to elect a labor party president. Oh, George, that would not well, be pretty. But, well, we're uh, survive. We've we've done, we've not done great, but we're the America's the mail's still getting delivered in the United States with Joe Biden as president. So. Uh, I survived Obama, okay, uh, and uh, I made a lot of money under Obama. I mean, there's good and bad out there, George. It is what it is. All right, so that's that's a full show for us. Forty seven minutes of talking about uh, the reaction to uh, General Synod passing forth a motion to have the bishops forward something about LLF. Can I do one little personal play at this point? For money? No, 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 no
<laughs> yeah. Well, if you want me to, I will ask for money. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Okay. no. Um, last night uh, we had our uh, interfaith uh, th- uh, Thanksgiving service, and mm-hmm. we had a number of my Christian colleagues decline to come, and I gave a uh, talk about Thanksgiving, and I gave a little talk about the Klotzenberger Rebbe, who was a uh, Jewish Holy rabbi. Cow, really? Yeah. Yes. Wow. And his, a- you know, Thanksgiving in times of crisis. Mm-hmm. Why I say this is that partic- perhaps more in England than the United States, but maybe up north, maybe in New York, maybe in Los Angeles. Now is the time for people in college to show up and be friends with your Jewish neighbors because mm-hmm. they're going through hell right now. Where we are, Kevin, in this part of the world, you don't see Palestinian flags. You don't see protesters. There's nothing. They don't have anything to worry. But we're seeing homes defaced, synagogue, Jewish children threatened on their way to school in London, uh, Jews being threatened in universities in New York City and Boston and MIT. Perhaps the time is now for Christians. We had a march of Christians for Israel last week. But my personal plea is, you know, let, let's stop talking and let's stand with our Jewish brethren in their hour of need. Our biggest problem right now is the demons of yesteryear are the heroes of today. Osama bin Laden. I mean, he's now a hero on TikTok because of his Dear America letter. And the the millennials have found it and said, he's right. No, he's a demon. Please don't. You know, uh, oh, Hitler. Oh, he wasn't so wrong after all. No, you, you, okay, if you wake up one morning and all of a sudden uh, you're on the side of Osama bin Laden, of um, Saddam Hussein, of Hitler, uh, of Mussolini, it, you have really gone astray and the church is here for you. Um, and, and that's the biggest problem is somehow uh, these, these demons of the past live on in social media. And I, I'm not saying that you have to be an uncritical supporter of the state of Israel. No, probably. I am saying yeah. stand by your Jewish brothers and sisters Absolutely. in your neighborhood and community because yeah. they are now under attack. Yeah. David Pelley. And they feel that they feel that yeah. attack. David Pelley said that. He said, of course, there's racism. Of course, there's problems in Israel. Of course, there's bias like any other country. However, let's sh- and he pointed out exactly what's been happening. I need to have him on again next week to to give a follow up. Uh, if you're wondering what's happening in Israel right now, uh, uh, the IDF has uh, I, okay. The news you're getting when you see CBS or NBC that's about a day and a half behind what's a- actually happening. They're they're through most of the tunnels now. I mean, they've gone and, and done a great job. They have not killed tens of thousands of civilians. Some civilians have been killed. Absolutely. That's what happens in war. But please don't believe this this uh, BS that's going on on the air, uh, that we have to have a ceasefire. I'm, I'm surprised by the lack of civilians that have uh, been injured or killed in this. Uh, what, one thing I should remind uh, most of our viewers know this already, but uh, if you rem- at the Nuremberg trials, 1945, 46, Six, yeah. after the Second World War, mm-hmm. one of the Einsatzgruppen, these were the fellows that uh, went around behind the lines after the German army, back the German army, rounding up Jews and shooting them. Yep. And they killed millions before, before the concentration camps, extermination camps were built. And the uh, Einsatzgruppe in defense was, Yes, we did bad things, but look what you allies did. Look at the, you killed civilians too. Look at the bombing of Dresden, the bombing of Hamburg. And the tribunals uh, at Nuremberg said, no, 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 no. You cannot excuse your actions based upon the response of the allies to the atrocities and the war done by the Germans. So these people are saying, oh, well, you know, it's bad what Hamas did, but look what Israel's doing now. That's already been adjudicated in international law, and I'm sorry, folks, it doesn't fly. Yeah, I'm surprised by the under 30 crowd, the under 25 crowd that endorses hostages and terrorism and 
the killing and maiming of women and children because they, they think that Palestine is occupied, that they live, in, in, that Israel has occupied their land. And it's like, is nobody teaching history anymore? Have, have, I mean, nope. do, can, can I not, I mean, I, history was my favorite topic in high school and I, we had a really good teacher and as such, nobody is learning anything in school except climate change. And, uh, there's a new saint. Her name is Greta Thornburg. And, you know, that's, that's all they learned in school. They have to watch Al Gore's movie. What was that called? Um, Whatever. Planted to the apes. I, Please, like that. Well, I mean, my kids would come home and, and from a Roman Catholic school, they went. Uh, we had to watch the Al Gore film a day, again, Dad. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know why why he gets so much press. All right, that's enough. Uh, 50, we, we've ruined people's afternoon. I'm sorry. Have a great weekend. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Gong, and you've been watching episode 831 of Anglican Unscripted.